Hey everyone, welcome to the Center for Creative Leadership webinar, Leadership in the Future of Healthcare, Befriending Polarity and Paradox. My name is Michelle Bryan and I'll serve as your webinar moderator for today's session. At the Center for Creative Leadership, also known as CCL, our sole focus is leadership development, education, and research. We specialize in scalable healthcare leadership programs that create cohesive, high-performing teams. Relying on five decades of experience in healthcare organizations, we deliver cost-efficient development programs designed to bring your best people together. In today's webinar, you'll learn six leadership paradoxes related to leading effectively in the future of healthcare and next steps for assessing your response. So I'd like to introduce our presenters today. So happy to have Amy Martinez is CCL's healthcare program manager, and Joanne Diaz is a senior faculty member here at CCL. Welcome, ladies. We appreciate you being with us today, and I will go ahead and turn it over to Joanne. Thank you, Michelle. Glad to meet everyone virtually, and I'm looking forward to spending our time together this next hour. So today, as Michelle outlined, we're going to be talking about the impact that uh, these rapid, unpredictable, paradoxical, and really tangled changes have had on the talent landscape when it comes to our healthcare world. Uh, we're going to look at how organizations and individual leaders can adapt to and leverage some of these changes uh, that are occurring right now, um, which could otherwise turn into a very overwhelming experience. And we're looking to turn, turn that into an opportunity to really thrive amidst all the turbulence. Pre-COVID-19, um, changes were already occurring when it came to the healthcare ecosystem. COVID-19 just put its foot on the gas. So there's five key ways in which talent is going to continue changing when it comes to the future of healthcare. The first one is with regard to how work actually gets done. So we're seeing a lot more of multidisciplinary teams coming together and overall teams operating together as a whole. The second one focuses on when and where work gets done. We're seeing a lot more global work and virtual work, uh, something called the Hollywood model of teams, where disparate members across organizations, across countries, and across entire uh, continents will come together to solve a problem, tackle an issue, and then disband and continue working. Who does the work is another uh, key way in which our talent landscape is changing. So we're seeing an increasingly diverse mix of age, experience, uh, part-time workers, internal, external. What does the work? Um, and this is one of my favorite phrases. So we talked about who does the work, but when it comes to what does the work, we're talking about the fact that AI and technology is taking a much larger role when it comes to providing uh, services within the healthcare industry as well as outside of it. And then finally, we're going to talk about the tools for managing talent. So there's a much greater emphasis on predictive analytics, big data, and leveraging talent platforms such as BE Smith, uh, Comp Health, and so forth. So feel free to put in any questions that you may have or notes that you may have into the chat. We've got a lot of things to cover here, so we will be keeping an eye on the chat and responding to things as they come up. So feel free to put, throw in your notes uh, throughout. So when it comes to change begets change, I absolutely love this quote. One of the things that we've seen is that COVID-19 has forced us to move much faster and really test out elements that we were perhaps rather slow to adapt. So one example that, that comes to mind right off the bat is getting physicians on board with using telehealth methods. So historically, there's been somewhat of a challenge with getting buy-in for leveraging telehealth methods. Uh, there typically has been a, um, a tendency to lean on the face-to-face -face interactions and so forth. And We've recently seen a ton of articles. We are hearing from healthcare systems that talk about the fact that COVID-19 has pushed um, telemedicine forward by a decade, if not more. And along with that comes a variety of different things that you have to navigate, right? Uh, updating IT systems and so forth in order to manage volume. So this is a quick overview. There's a lot on the slides. I'm going to leave it up here and I'm going to speak to some of the pieces of it. This is an overview 
of some of the changes uh, that have occurred within our healthcare ecosystem due to COVID-19. This obviously is not all of the changes that have occurred, but we wanted to pull out some of the ones that we're hearing from our healthcare partners the most often. So I mentioned telemedicine already. Uh, the fact that telemedicine has now been accelerated by almost a decade is something that we're hearing both from the patient perspective as well as the healthcare provider perspective. And with that comes its own challenges, right? Um, this pertains to both primary care um, as well as how to interact with specialists more often and um, how, how do you manage IT systems. Uh, I was recently visiting my endocrinologist who talked about the fact that she absolutely loves telemedicine. The challenge is she spent 30 minutes of time in, in an hour appointment, let's say. She spent 30 minutes of time trying to navigate um, communication issues because the audio didn't work, the video didn't work, and so forth. There's challenges, but at least we're ha now having the opportunity to really test out things and how they operate. Home care is another um, move that we're seeing. We're seeing a move towards increased um, home care over nursing homes. So COVID-19 has had a rather devastating impact when it comes to nursing homes specifically. Uh, and we're seeing a move towards in-home health aids as um, a new way of operating. When it comes to care resources, there's a, there's a few different factors in here. There's the vaccine development, obviously, the drug manufacturing and drug affordability. All conversations that have been happening uh, in the background, especially when it comes to drug manufacturing and affordability, but these are things that have now been pushed to the surface. Uh, I'll touch on affordability, for example. While we're seeing more and more people lose access to health insurance, which I'm also going to touch on next, uh, the challenge then becomes how are people able to manage the cost of drugs that are being, afforded, that are being created. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal that vaccines are being developed and we're now seeing an increased reliance on pharma companies, which in the past may have suffered from a reputation of being profiteers. Um, right now, the entire world is starting to focus their attention on who is going to be able to come up with the, the, this vaccine and how quickly. And then the next question turns to, well, where is this vaccine going to, man, going to be manufactured? Because obviously, we're moving from a landscape that used to be far more global um, into more of a national outlook in terms of gaining access to uh, the different drugs that need to come uh, to the population as quickly as possible, as well as the affordability overall. And then finally, financing and risk. Um, I mentioned insurance coverage losses very quickly. So we in the U.S. have typically had employer-based health care. And with unemployment being at a record rate right now, there's the question around is this an effective way of operating and is this sustainable uh, comes bubbling to the surface. Amy, would you have anything else to add at this point? I want to make sure I pull you in before I, I skip to our next slide. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. Um, yeah, in general, I would say that all of these kind of add up to this last point about this, uh, this term corona effect, which really just implies that these particular changes, a lot of these that you've just mentioned, have shifted the overall landscape. Probably not particularly new news to a lot of you on the call, given you're in the healthcare industry, but we are seeing the impacts of this affect leaders in some pretty profound ways, uh, kind of the direction we wanted to spend the rest of our time on. So we wanted to set this background uh, landscape, which Joanne just did for us, and, and move into kind of well, what does it all mean for healthcare leaders? Thank you, Amy. Now, one of the things that we cannot Skip talking about is the fact that some of these conversations that have been happening um, in the healthcare ecosystem have been happening for a while. Um, I've mentioned telemedicine quite a few times, but um, when it comes to diversity and equity, it is impossible to talk about the healthcare ecosystem without actually talking about some of the health disparities. Um, and racial inequities that have come to the surface as a result of, uh, I'm seeing a lot of people post that they can't hear me. Just want to do a quick check. Can I, can, yes, you're okay. Regina, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank fine. you so much. 
want to make sure. All right. Um, when it comes to the social determinants of health, um, we cannot avoid the fact that COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted people of color. Um, the recent murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement, rather the amplification of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that has happened over the last two months has pushed the conversation around inequity to the forefront. And it is an important thing. We're not going to be delving into this uh, a ton throughout, but we wanted to make sure that we highlighted it because this is something that continues to um, run in the past. It sort of existed underneath the surface in the wings, so to speak, uh, because there wasn't as much attention being paid to it. As of right now, it is a conversation that is happening every day. We're hearing it happen in, at all levels of the healthcare ecosystem. So our main note, and the reason that you, you've joined us today, we're here to talk about what polarity and paradox actually means when it comes to creating a new normal within the healthcare ecosystem. So starting off by giving you an overview of what paradoxes uh, actually, oh, sorry, what polarities mean. When it comes to problems versus polarities. Problems tend to have a one and done answer or solution. Something along the lines of what software system are we going to use? That's a problem to solve. When it comes to polarities, those, are, those tend to have ongoing and interdependent solutions. So how do we move forward strategically? Um, an entire complexity of options that, there, that have polarities to leverage within them. So. This is the, the definition. I'll leave this up here for a second while you take a look at it. And while I navigate across two screens. <laughs> we sometimes call polarities wicked problems and chronic tensions. They're ongoing dilemmas that seem at the surface level to be contradictory uh, with no easy solutions. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we navigate between those um, when it comes to leveraging the context as well. These are a few of the polarities that we experience in healthcare, um, and these existed prior to COVID-19, uh, and they will continue to exist afterwards, margin versus mission, volume versus value, and so forth. But we wanted to focus in on the polarities that have really bubbled to the surface as a result of COVID-19. So this short-term fix versus long-term strategy, are, are we putting something in place in order to meet the immediate need right now, or is this something that we need to take a step back and actually address for the longer term? Because our landscape has changed and the way that we work has changed. What we'd like you to do, we've given you a few examples here. We know there are a lot more. We'd love you to take a minute and uh, put in any polarities that you've observed, either in your organization uh, before or after the arrival of COVID. And as you go ahead and type those in, I'm going to turn this over to Amy. Our next yeah, slide. Home versus work, global versus local. All great points brought to the forefront, accentuated by COVID. Absolutely. And thrusting leaders, to be quite honest, into a space and place where there might not have been a lot of experience. Um, present and virtual, again, yes, essential staff, uh, non-essential staff. Uh, I appreciate this uh, one comment here about directive versus collaborative leadership. We're going to touch on that, absolutely. Um, again, sort of a re-emphasis of the short-term versus long-term. Yeah, absolutely. I'm loving the comments here. Um, the, the view that uh, do you have your eyes set on the large organization or the department, we're seeing some of that. Again, command control versus uh, a flattened organization. Another person here saying yes, uh, down versus horizontal. So some, some definite shifts there. 
Uh, and again, the disparities the, in healthcare outcomes, the social determinants of health, uh, really taking um, a, a spotlight in the COVID, in the wake of COVID. Um, so I, I really appreciate what's coming in here um, because these are exactly the type of polarities that many times existed already within the healthcare landscape but they were not necessarily something that we had to deal with as leaders day in and day out. Um, many of you probably as leaders in the life sciences or healthcare sector did not necessarily think about, oh, and I have you know, some of my staff as virtual and some of them as not, or now all of a sudden I'm managing an entirely virtual team and I've never had to do that. Um, these are things that all of a sudden we found ourselves you know, smack dab in the middle of. So what we decided to do is say, okay, you know, given this, and this is very, very, very real for leaders, what does this imply? Like where are leaders now uh, in terms of trying to deal with it? And how do they work their way through this? Because it's a very tough situation. Um, so we appreciate your sharing that, I, that you were spot on and giving some polarity examples um, and we are really grateful for those. I kind of want to transition uh, to talk about the effect of those polarities, right? And that's what we became interested in. How are these polarities affecting leaders? And what we realized is that when leaders are in a polarity situation, they often are also in a situation of paradoxical leadership. The two seem to go together. It's almost as if you cannot get around being in a paradox situation if you're in a polarity. And sometimes these words are even used interchangeably. We're drawing a distinction today to sort of point to polarity being something that not only is interdependent but seemingly contradictory, but it's at that enterprise or more organizational level. That's really the way we're framing it in today's webinar context. And paradox we're really using to refer to the situation that the leader him or herself faces in responding within a, uh, an environment that contains a polarity. So I wanted to draw that distinction. Even though, you know, if you go look up these terms, you may see that they're often interchangeable. But imagine yourself, right? You don't probably have to imagine. This is real for you. Uh, but imagine the healthcare leader. Um, or the pharma leader, the medical device company leader, who every day they get up and they're facing a very stark polarity. And now they're trying to lead within that polarity and realize that there are paradoxical responses at play here. What do we mean by that? You know, Joanne covered the definition of polarity. I want to spend a second covering the definition of paradox for us, again, in this context, as it refers to the leader's response in a polarity. Paradox here, the way we're defining it, is a situation that does combine contradictory qualities, but that when enacted, proves to be with worthwhile or well-founded. Some very just normal examples from everyday life. Sweet and spicy, right? Gotta love that sweet and spicy sauce or the sweet and spicy chicken, right? This is that tough and loving type of response. If any of you have children, you know what we mean by tough love. It's that combination. Um, that is not, you know, not unusual to find in life because, quite honestly, paradox and polarities exist in life every turn. With healthcare being one of the the most exemplary uh, industries where you can find them, I even like to use this example I did um, live in, uh, excuse me, LinkedIn live chat last week where breathing itself is a polarity, the inhalation and the exhalation, a polarity. They cannot exist. Those two cannot exist without each other. Examples of these paradoxes in life, and you know them, is, are some of the ones you see here. The only constant is change. Your actions speak louder than words. Not making a decision is a decision. So this is sort of what we're saying here is that you've got what seems like two ends or poles in the response options as a leader when you're dealing with polarities, and we want to explore what that means, right? What does that really mean for a leader? Well, this is a good way to kind of set that up because if you're talking about leadership, you're also naturally talking about followership, and followers have an expectation, like it or not, that leaders should be almost like they're 
uh, have a superhero type of quality, as well as this sense of just be like me, like just be regular old me that I can relate to, but also know how to handle everything <laughs> when it's needed. Um, and that are those are competencies uh, that come in contradictory pairs that look like these, right? We want a leader who can challenge us to grow and develop, but also support us. We want someone who can lead, particularly in difficult and challenging situations, but also empower us. We want them to be structured, right? We don't want to walk into chaos, yet we want them to be flexible enough to change when we have what we deem to be a better idea. These are natural examples that we face um, when we are in leadership. So these are natural paradoxes. When we take a look at the future of healthcare, it's easier to kind of look at these in three segments in a very simple head, heart, and hands type of model, where we look at the head as being the piece that's uh, pulling on uh, the prefrontal cortex executive functioning of uh, our thinking, the reasoning part of our brain. Whereas when we look at the heart, we're really talking about that emotional component of leadership and the hands, sort of that hands on actually doing the work. Um, and the field of healthcare often refer to that as staffing. You know, many many leaders at times, particularly in shortages um, or when there are you know a lot of callouts, are staffing. They are actually jumping in the trenches and doing work as well. But when we take a look at this model and we apply it to the future of healthcare in terms of paradoxes, what we see are six paradoxes, and these paradoxes kind of line up to a head, hearts, and hands, you know, model where. And I, I introduced these last week. I want to go into a little bit more detail about them where we see, for example, first up with the head is the clarity versus ambiguity. We expect leaders to somehow or another have clarity. I mean, when you think about returning to work, you really want clear guidelines. You know, people oftentimes today don't really want to walk back into their work setting or have, did not want to walk back into their work setting if they've already returned to work or actually never stopped going to the work setting. They didn't want to do so without some clear guidelines that would ensure their own safety and not jeopardize their safety and their family's safety. So clarity was desired, but so much was still unknown about the virus and still is. So there's a great deal of ambiguity. So a leader is moving between this, this space of clarity and ambiguity and somehow or another needing to respond in every given situation along this line. Resolve and openness. Resolve sort of re points to this, uh, and I'm going to give you some, some, some imagery, right, because I think that really says it. This to me is a great, great point of ambiguity and clarity. I went back here just just a second to say, right, we know almost what's clear right in front of our eyes. Everything else is hazy. So it's got that eye chart going on when you go uh, to that optometrist. Um, but let's talk a second about openness and resolve, right? Because when a leader gets to the point of needing to make decisions, we want the leader to have the resolve, which sort of points to that, please be decisive, right? Please don't just continuously be wishy-washy or, you know, not make the decision because in, the, in that regard, you are making a decision. But we also want you to remain open. Please remain open to possibilities of this or that coming in and changing it. Um, so we expect the leader to have some sense of flexibility um, when it comes to having the decisive nature. So really what we're asking leaders to be is sort of stay in this, I guess you could say, exploration stage. Stay in a frame of mind that is willing to explore either openness or resolve when needed. But please get it right because we're expecting that. And that's what followers are sort of putting upon leaders. And, you know, like it or not, whether it's stated or not, that's the, that's the reality that many face. I want to talk about compassion and toughness for a second. You know, this one... Um, I shared last week an example on the LinkedIn Live about compassion and toughness when I talked about I was recently um, getting that chemo infusion, and during it, uh, there was a staff nurse uh, who had been called back to be with a patient who had to have COVID testing, um, and she was symptomatic, and this particular nurse was pregnant and was obviously very, very concerned, and the leader that... Uh, that I was with at the moment, I was watching this leader really struggle with, you know, okay, do I tell her, no, you need to stay in there in isolation with this patient until the test results were done, which is ultimately were the guidelines, or do you, do you take into effect and have, you know, the sense of deep compassion for this nurse who's really having a very hard moment? 
to be in that particular room. That's one example, right? Because we have guidelines, but those guidelines or those those expectations that we place on staff, they can be hard on the leader to enact when people are having emotional responses. This is what pulls us in that uh, realm, the emotional realm of leadership, right? Do I expect people to put their own lives on the line and do I come down on them when there's some um, sense of, you know, resistance around that um, or do I show compassion? Right? The answer we'd like to naturally say is, oh, you do both, right? And while that's beautiful, it's not so easy. And that's kind of what we're going to talk a little bit more about in a second. Vulnerability and confidence. This really gets to that point of we expect, and this is not just by, let me just be really clear, this is not just a COVID effect only. We've always expected this. The leaders were just seeing it more emphasized in the period of COVID, where we want our leaders to, to show their vulnerability, to be accessible, to be real, to be authentic. But we also want them to be confident. I mean, we don't want them to be inappropriately weak. We want them to um, have that sense of knowing what to do. But but please be vulnerable enough that we can relate to you and you, and you don't seem to to be what I keep calling inaccessible to us when we're concerned about our own safety or about just protocol uh, around unknown situations and what to do. And then lastly, I want to kind of talk about the hands part. So, you know, there's two sides here that leaders walk between with this hands-off approach, um, meaning, okay, I'm going to fully empower um, you all as the team to figure it out, um, and the sense of self-reliance. And the self-reliance is that, that sense that the leader says, wow, you know, nobody really has the answer. If it's going to get done, I'm probably going to have to figure it out and do it myself and set that example, do the work, uh, role model it, and then many times just continue to do the work, particularly when they find themselves in unique, challenging, uh, or understaffed situations. So they're trying to walk between how much do I hand over, you know, expectations to people to figure it all out versus um, get in there and do things myself. And that's a hard line to walk. And Anne, I appreciated your comment. Uh, Anne was just saying that, yes, so many of these are definitely more emphasized due to COVID. And then lastly, with the hands piece, we're talking about directing versus coaching. You know, that was brought up as one of the paradoxes earlier. Someone mentioned that they had seen uh, since the arrival of COVID. And it's true. Um, when we're talking about issues of safety, you know, there have been many a leader who decided to take a very directive stance, you know, enforcing uh, maybe very strict expectations and guidelines within the healthcare setting. And we have to remember that coaching can't just go out the door either. So when we're trying to build up uh, a sense of empowerment, a sense of confidence for the, those below you to be able to function in a new environment, we also need to coach them uh, because we won't always be there as the leader to tell them what to do. Um, and that's the type of behavior that we, we want to pull forward in order to make them feel empowered. And yet, when do we choose to be directive versus when do we choose to coach? These are the challenges leaders are facing and they're facing them daily. So here they all are again, right? These kind of lay them out um, and put them um, all together so you kind of get that full effect again of what leaders are almost in a way tightrope walking between both ends of this spectrum here and you know it's not a a situation where um, there's an easy answer and and yet there is hope and that's what we're going to get into in just a minute any other examples of paradoxes that you have personally managed any other examples that maybe weren't here? Or what did we forget, right? You know, we, there's no way this is a comprehensive list. We know that. We put it out here um, as an example of some of the most poignant or um, most, I guess you could, you could say, frequently struggled with or seen. But what did we miss? I want to hear from you all. Let's see uh, what the attendees have to, have to say. I'll give it a minute here for the chat because it's always uh, longer to type than it is to talk. So let's see, transparency. Oh, I love this point, Chuck. Transparency versus maintaining morale. 
you got it. Um, because this is a situation of do we really tell them sometimes how much we don't have it all figured out or what we're struggling with or what roadblock we've encountered? Uh, because if they knew that, they may lose morale or lose faith in us. That's such a great point, Chuck. Um, I bet if you were able to talk, you you would share so much more about what you've struggled with with that. I loved uh, the point here about um, the, the sense of, of, again, teamwork, um, you know, do, how much do we empower the team to figure things out versus try to do it ourselves as a leader. Julie, that was a great point. And then this last one um, right here, uh, oh, wow, they're coming in great now. Um, oh, the speed versus patience, that's so true. And I also saw this whole thing of, are we going to continue to work virtually? I know that so many of the people that we've spoken to have brought that up, um, that they want these answers, right? Just like we want them for school, by the way, right? This is, you know, we're talking about healthcare industry, but, you know, the educational sector is struggling as well. People want answers, and these are answers that we don't necessarily know yet. I mean, even our leaders at, at governmental levels are, are struggling with this and have different opinions. So we see these tensions, these chronic tensions constantly. And so, you know, really what we wanted to share today is that all of these are real and we wanted to validate them. And we wanted to also just let you know, no, you're not, you know, you're not crazy for feeling torn between the two ends here. And the ones that we've seen come in as examples are all that we were all spot on, to be honest. Um, I like Abigail's behavior, telling people to make sure to cut off work at 5 p.m. so it doesn't bleed over. Another person had mentioned this uh, this work-life balance or work-life integration. Um, that is so true. You know, now it's not uncustomary to hear the dogs in the background, right? Um, you might hear uh, doorbells going off. You 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 hear children uh, coming into into the background or right on screen in, in the Zoom calls. These are these are all real effects that we're uh, living with and going through. Um, baby feeding, that's exactly right, Tim. All of a sudden, we have brought our, our non-professional, which we always had, um, the personal side straight into the professional spectrum. And that becomes hard to lead because at what point do you say now, oh, well, that wasn't something you should have done in a work setting. And you know what? It was so much easier to say, oh, here's the line when you're in the work setting as, as opposed to now, you know, in a virtual setting. And then people are wanting to know, hey, when will we go back to work? So that point of patience versus, you know, um, being uh, just realizing that people want an answer. They want a speedy, you know, decision. But you have to be patient when we're, no when we're dealing with not knowing. The not knowing is so hard for people. So take a breath right because this is the reality and we recognize how difficult the space is to lead from um, i appreciate and joanne does too how you are dealing with it every day um, and we want to give you some some hope here that there's a framework in play that you can re rely on a framework and in particular that particular framework really gets into this whole idea that forces um, pull us in one direction or another. As a leader, when we are deciding how to respond, we need to be sensitive to the fact that there are forces at play here. We cannot, as a leader, just randomly, without much thought, be pulled along the tight ropes that exist here just willy-nilly with, without what we would call intention. That being said, we're going to start first before we talk about these forces by saying that hitting that perfect balance right between both ends of the, the spectrums or the continuums of these paradoxical situations is an illusion. Balance is truly not possible. If you feel like you hit it, it's fleeting. Um, and that's very, very normal. It's not really a balance that you're striving for when we're dealing with paradoxical situations. Instead, it's about being able to move fluidly with intention. Uh, and that's really what Joanne is going to get into next as we talk about these forces. So, Joanne, I invite you to move into that space to talk about some of these forces at play. Thank you, Amy. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on this right now because I'm seeing this come through in the chat. Uh, there's a few comments around work-life balance. 
And then there was another comment from Randall talking about the fact that his teams have actually appreciated the fact that kids and partners and pets that show up on our video calls right now are part of the experience. It, it creates a more personal interaction with the people that you're working with. And so um, I appreciate that polarity view of, okay, this is the way that we need to be, um, as Amy mentioned, the illusion of it versus what life actually looks like and flexing along that continuum. So right here, you'll see that there's really two components when it comes to navigating some of these paradoxes, these polarities that come up. So the first one is around intentionality. So how intentional, how aware are you of your choice of direction and how you want to move and how intentional then is your decision to move forward? The other piece that is incredibly important to focus on is flexibility. Understanding the fact that balance is, as mentioned earlier, as you saw it on the slide, balance tends to be an illusion. It's about developing the flexibility to move from one side of the continuum to the other um, or rest in between, wherever you are required to move or navigate to for the best of the situation and the people that you're leading in that moment. So there's four factors that come into play, four things that we've noticed you have to pay attention to when it comes to making decisions around intentionality and flexibility and your specific leadership response. And I've got them up on the screen right now. I'm going to delve a little further into each one of them. The first one is focused on organizational culture. So what does your actual organizational culture dictate or emphasize in order to create your leader response? So organizational culture refers to how things get done. Uh, that means the behaviors of the individuals, whether they're spoken or unspoken. We all know what it's like to, to have our set of rules that we're fully aware of, that are written down, that are housed in HR, um, and the ones that are unspoken, that are focused on values or beliefs of the organization as well as the individuals that um, exist within the organization. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So here are a few things to think about when it comes to a leader's response associated with organizational culture. So leadership standards of behavior, uh, reward and recognition of leadership effectiveness. And please feel free to type in any ones that come to mind as you start thinking about this. One of the things that I want to connect us back to is uh, the quick note that we had around health inequities. This is one of the ways that you can see health inequities start to surface as part of perhaps bias within the organizational culture and organizational system. I'm seeing a comment here. One of the things I told my team right away is not to apologize for the baby crying or the dogs barking. Right, it's about changing, changing your, your interaction uh, with the people that you're engaging with and, and sort of bringing in that feeling of what, well, what does reality look like? What is the particular situation? What's our context right now? Absolutely. I was going to just jump in here too, Joanne, and say you know, many of you, if we were to ask you to describe your organizational culture, you probably could give us maybe the top three to five words that might capture that. And I think this is an example of how a leader has to, to frame up their decisions right, you know, um, as to which end of the spectrum do they move toward. I imagine some of you are part of a system or an enterprise that may lean more right or more left on those paradoxical spectrums. Um, and as a result, you probably kind of say, oh, well, this is sort of typical for our organization, and therefore I'm going to lean in this direction or that direction. Um, that would be pretty normal. So we're, we're talking about forces that all of which have to be taken into account. And um, with Joanne's talking about org culture, you know, it, it, tying it back to the health inequities, which, you know, we believe is one of the best ways from a cultural standpoint to attack um, health inequities is to see it reflected uh, in leadership's decisions, right? And while it's everyone's responsibility, it really does, um, it really does come down to leadership to make some of these decisions that make a difference. And I hear, see here Randall talking about social justice and stewardship. Um, so 
again, where your organization stands on this um, does inform your responses, whether you're conscious of it or not. Um, and that's kind of our point. Hopefully, we want to suggest you're increasing your consciousness of, of that, your conscious awareness of it in every given situation. So, Joanne, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to get off my excited point about that or culture. And, and no, you, you you stay right here with me, Amy. <laughs> you stay right here with me. Um, but, so we're going to move to talking about your team setting specifically. So the team setting refers to the present context, where the individual leader operates. So it may comprise of direct reports that you have, but it may also include temporary team members. When we talk about agility, um, a lot of the word agility has been existing within our leadership uh, ecosystem for quite a while now. Uh, and there tends to be a strong desire for agility, but without a full comprehension of some of the factors that go into building agility. And part of that is how are you setting up the team? How are you creating that particular team environment that will then enable your people to do their best? And part of setting up that right team environment is goes back to those two factors that we just talked about, right? How intentional are you around the decisions that you make for your team? And how flexible are you? Because those teams are going to change. We're seeing that more and more uh, nowadays as disparate members come together to solve a problem, address an, a situation, and then keep moving. I'll give you a few considerations um, to think about when it comes to a uh, leadership response uh, when it, regarding a team setting. So what sort of trust exists within the team? How long does a team work together? Is this a team that, you know, comes together for this one particular thing? So you're meeting maybe an hour a week uh, for a few months, or have you had a chance to build um, an actual culture of a team? Uh, what sort of diversity do you have within the team? Uh, what experience level do your different team members have? And I'm seeing some comments in here around making, making sure people take time off to minimize burnout and negativity. Uh, boundaries are so important for all team members, absolutely. Um, one of the, the key things that's happening right now is that the healthcare um, entire industry is working overtime. Um, they're very, and with the move to work from home, our boundaries have become more dotted lines, really. Uh, there's, there, you know, everything is, is sort of interspersed, right? Um, I'm hoping you can't hear my neighbor mowing his lawn right now, but that's, that's the way our current world works. I think this is, you know, also a, a great point to this last bullet on the left side here, the staffing mix productivity metrics. You know, I, I think about how that plays in, for example, on a leader who is trying to judge whether to be compassionate and understanding about a particular request uh, they may be making of an employee to, um, to staff a particular um, shift, or that sense of toughness. And there's a great example. You're, you're facing a particular productivity situation and you're asking someone to do something um, or maybe even go to a redeployed place that they are not feeling comfortable with. Um, th this is then, you know, what you have to consider. What am I doing in that business context and what's been the, my precedent with this within a team setting? Um, all of these factors and more, right, Joanne? I mean, we haven't even mm -hmm. touched on them all. Um, and the leader's almost doing this, this file system in their head or should be kind of thinking through all of these points. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just kind of I'm going to move us to the next one, the individual leader. Uh, so the person who has responsibility for the team operating within the local context. And I'm going to move us over to the specific considerations, and I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, so I was recently having a conversation with the CMO. Uh, and her perspective was, it, where my team is, I am. <laughs> so if my team is going into the office, I will go into the office as well because it's all hands on deck where this is just how we operate. This is how we work. And she was utterly shocked to discover that her team actually asked her to go home. Um, their perspective was that they needed, she was more valuable in her leadership role 
as opposed to one of the hands on deck right now. And so it, it was interesting to, to hear and see the shock on her face as she was telling me this story um, and understanding that this went against everything that she she was accustomed to doing. It, it, it went against the way she worked, it went against her values and so forth. Um, it was a hard decision to make. And going back to that polarity of openness versus resolve, you know, did she go towards the resolve of, no, this is the way things have always been done, so this is what I need to do? Or did she take a chance and be more open to the fact that this is something that her team has asked her to do because it's of importance to them? I'm seeing a few more questions come through. Amy, anything else to add on, on individual leader? I think we, we see um, this really well represented um, when someone says, oh, you know, my particular leadership style is X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. Maybe it's highly collaborative, you know, maybe it's um, very social and um, communicative, um, or maybe it's very matter of fact, you know, who, who knows? They, they fill it in with some explanation or description. And, you know, what we're really saying here is if you can answer that, you're probably already down the wrong path when it comes to really being a flexible leader, and in particular when leading in a paradox, um, because you have to be so flexible that you're almost um, – your, your style, so to say, and I've got that in air quotes, is almost imperceptible because you're so fluid along the spectrum that you can consider all of these forces at play and change your response accordingly. That's not to say that you've lost your authenticity. It's just to say that you're able to read and assess the situation well enough to flex. And this is where that individual leader's own preferences can become a difficult roadblock um, because we all have our personality preferences. We all have, you know, things that trigger us or things that upset us or make, you know, make us feel certain negative emotions. And so trying to balance all of these um, along with being a flexible leader, it's tough. Um, and that's where you see the height of emotional intelligence being needed so much when it comes to being able to be agile like this. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm seeing questions and, and comments come in, and I am appreciating them, and I'm going to move us to the last factor uh, on this list of situational agility when it comes to the individual team member. Uh, we can't talk about a leader in isolation, right? Um, it's, leadership is a social process, which means that we need to make sure that we're accounting for the individual team members as well, the, the, the people who are accountable to the leader within their given team setting. And these are some of the specific considerations, same as the, the leadership uh, list. So personality preferences, performance, expertise, potential. Now, it is important to note the fact that all of these different factors exist against a backdrop that is changing incredibly fast. We've said it before, we'll, say, we'll continue to say it. Um, we're all learning new ways of working right now. Uh, and this is where the paradoxes and polarities come into play. We're having to lean on new systems, new situations, new ways of mentoring uh, team members, onboarding team members, as I saw come through uh, in the chat. And this is where that flexibility and adaptability, uh, how much do I enforce uh, utilizing a, a particular existing system the way it actually is, or do we try and figure out new ways of integrating uh, the tools that are available to us in order to make sure that we're allowing each person to work in the best way possible in order to meet our goals right now? Amy, am I hearing you? I really loved Mary Beth's point um, here about, it's gonna be interesting to see how interview questions change. How interesting, I agree with you completely. Um, and you, you bring up a, a real reality here um, in the sense that, you know, there has been reluctance um, for people to feel comfortable in some, in some places, in certain situations, to return to work, right? I, I mean, I know people who actually have decided to retire or actually change entire careers and move, move out of healthcare due to being smack dab in the, in the COVID sort of front lines. Um, and so we know that that's a reality. And so here we are as leaders trying to, to make hiring decisions. Um, and in light of 
you know, what's going on in our world socially, politically, morally, trying to decide the best talent. What do you do in a situation where you as a leader may have inherited someone who perhaps wasn't the right cultural fit, and yet now you need them because you have people who are leaving? This is a great situation of finding yourself having to walk a paradoxical spectrum. And do you make uh, certain decisions, right, that call on you to be very resolved, or do you stay open and try to work with that person, coaching them? Do you direct them? I'm hoping that we're, we're, we're painting a picture of, like, the real world. Um, so I really appreciated your comment there about the interview questions. I think that's so true. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so all in all, really what we're talking about, what we see, uh, all these forces at play coming together, when uh, you as a leader are optimally at your best in responding in paradoxical situations, set within the broader context of polarities within the organization, really what we're suggesting is to take a pause Try to really consider the forces here, the org culture, the team setting, you yourself as the leader and the individual team member uh, in question that you're dealing with. Try to remember all of these things as best you can with intentionality so that you can frame your response along these paradox paradoxical continuums the, the way that you think is best for the situation. So in closing, we say, first of all, Determine if you have a polarity on your hands, because if you do, it's highly likely you're facing paradoxical continuums as the leader as well. And as a leader, do your best to size up the situation, right? Taking, taking care around those four considerations. Are we saying these are the only ones out there? Absolutely not. Um, there are even broader mega um, or meta context that we could have brought in here. Um, there are even more micro contexts that we could have brought in, but we didn't. We're trying to, to just say, try to focus on these four. That will get you down the road uh, in a pretty good, pretty good, um, pretty well, I should say. Um, and that's, that's a good, good start. Um, but try to bring that intentionality in because as you do, you will see that your flexibility becomes stronger. Um, when you do make a decision along those continuums, Use your network when you need to really kind of validate your thinking and in in what you've decided upon. Sometimes you don't have time to do that. Other times you may need to do that. Make the time. Um, so here are examples. Turn to those mentors, the trusted colleagues. Perhaps it's your board. Maybe it's a leadership coach. Whomever it is to help you make sure that you're really considering all the forces at play, particularly when you're dealing with situations where you have no prior experience, the heat is high, so you're in a high-stake situation, or it's very sensitive or complex. Um, I would say that COVID has, has put most of most people in all of those at the same time. And then lastly, we just want to leave you with the fact of give yourself grace, right? Because it is not easy to become fluid and fluent um, when moving uh, across paradoxical continuums. But we want to give you hope that as you practice intentionality and flexibility, it will become easier. So we thank you today for joining us uh, and giving us your time. We have so appreciated the comments you made. I want to recognize my co-host, um, Joanne, who, for her tremendous insight and, and help as we talked about this with you. So thank you, Joanne, and thank you for all the attendees for the great comments. This would be a great time for us to take some questions. Great, Amy. Thank you so much. And if you guys have a question, just put it in the chat. Um, we do have a couple that have come through. Um, one of them, how are people enforcing boundaries when there is more work than ever? That's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. And here again, we see this compassion versus toughness, right? The enforcement of boundaries, is it a directive situation? Is it a coaching situation because someone's, you know, not practicing good work-life integration or balance? Um, let's hear from a few people, um, and thank you for all the thank yous. We appreciate it. Um, anybody have um, a, a comment, first of all? I'd, I'd like to hear before we take a stab at that. How are you enforcing boundaries? What are you finding works? I'm going to give it a for those comments to come in. Oh, <laughs> oh it seems like we've got another question. Yeah, so I, go ahead, Joanne. And I saw someone call out the point around how do we ensure that people are setting those self-care guidelines for themselves? 
uh, and how are people identifying ways to care for themselves given that we're all in, in our four walls as of right now. So I'm seeing a few comments here uh, in, around setting expectations, mm -hmm. um, making sure that when you communicate during one-on-ones, um, how you're clearly articulating what people can actually get done and communicating those back. So I'm seeing expectations uh, come across a few times in yeah, terms of... Yeah, you're totally right, Joanne. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like we see see people also, I love this comment Rosario made about, uh, I gently remind people of my working hours, right? Um, and mm -hmm. recognizing that not everyone is going to work uh, those same hours, so uh, a practice of that is, is helpful. Um, you know, it, on that note, as you're establishing boundaries, um, it, it, sometimes the one of the one the, one of the best ways to to go about that too is to enter that conversation from a place of inquiry, right? Um, asking um, people how they see boundaries, how they see work life integration, um, and how they see it be practiced on the team. Um, that's from a place of trying to seek to to understand, and then perhaps from there making the decision of, of how you're going to approach that. Is it going to be one of enforcing and directing, or is it going to be a different type of response? Um, mm -hmm. So really appreciate the comments here, but, but that kind of um, understanding can help you as you're thinking about the team member, the team setting, et cetera. You know, I saw another question. Joanne, anything to add to that before I tackle uh -huh. another question that came in? I'll just punctuate it with what Abigail said, uh, which was recognizing that everyone is experiencing this differently. Um, I think that's a great statement and one that's important to keep reminding ourselves of, especially when we're in an environment that feels very, very narrow. Uh, so great call out there. Amy, yeah. next question, go ahead. And I, and I saw a comment here from um, oh, a former colleague of mine um, that was a great one, which is be curious and not furious. Um, so take that time to understand where is that team member coming from and in what setting are they operating, right? Going back to the forces, let me ask them some questions out of, out of true curiosity to help and frame my response. Um, one of the questions that came up, and I thought this was a really great point, was around the whole uh, idea that, wow, with each of these particular forces, do we have paradoxes? You know, and that's taking it to an increased level of complexity. So I think what the person was, was getting at, and it was a comment from a, a, a few back now, um, was, hey, we may have paradoxical continuums going on within each of the forces. And yes, that can be true. Um, so we may have an org culture, for example, that pushes towards um, being very hands off, okay? And yet we may have a team member who uh, demands um, that they get the guidance um, and they need you in a very directive way to be involved with them. So uh, perhaps the setting is such that it's new and it's, it's convoluted and messy and confusing and so the team itself wants more from you and yet the org culture has been a hands-off type of approach. So yes, to your point, you can be facing, uh, you know, these paradoxical, uh, the, what I call the gravitational pull towards differences. And this is where it gets tricky that you have to do your best to figure out which one is perhaps stronger and which one may carry more weight and have an impact on the results you're achieving. And you do your best to assess and keep learning from those experiences. Um, Great, great comments here. Uh, I realize we're at the top of the hour, so I apologize that we, we can't get into everything in the depth that we would like, but I really am valuing your comments, so thank you so much. Yeah, and um, thank you, Joanne and Amy, for sharing the six leadership paradoxes related to leading effectively in the healthcare ecosystem's next normal. Um, tomorrow, everyone who attended the webinar will receive a follow-up email with links to the webinar recording relevant industry articles and leadership resources in time of, times of crisis. So as you exit the webinar, we hope you'll take a moment to complete the evaluation so we can continue to make these webinar events well worth your time. Thank you again, Joanne and Amy. Uh, this has been very insightful and I appreciate all of you attending um, and hope to see you on the next one. Thanks, Michelle. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Michelle. Amy. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.